hello, everyone. Welcome to another live stream of History by Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Professor Chris Keefe, and today we're going to be continuing our discussion from where we last left off, in which we were discussing the literacy of Jesus. Was he literate? Was he not literate? How did the gospel describe his literacy? And we're just going to continue on that topic. So welcome back to the show, Professor Keefe. Well, thank you, Jacob, for having me. I'm honored to be here. Of course. Um, let's start off with this. We have Dead Sea Scrolls, and we have Maccabean literature. And I'm bringing that up real quick because the typical thing that a lot of scholars will say is, is that most of Jesus' followers, if not nearly all of them, were illiterate. That is at least a general assumption that a lot of scholars take. And they'll say that most Jews in general were also illiterate. But we do have Dead Sea Scrolls. Maccabean texts as well. What do those texts and other texts, uh, other Jewish texts like the Wisdom of Sirach, tell us about the literacy levels of the Jewish population, both prior and during Jesus' uh, Jesus's time? Do you mean uh, the literacy level of the Jewish population in general? Or do you mean the literacy of the population of the communities in which those texts were, uh, you know, composed, uh, put on papyrus and, uh, and circulated? In general, but I'm also curious about the other thing you just brought up. Um, could you discuss both? Yeah, okay. What that what something like the Dead Sea Scrolls says about the literacy of the Jewish population in general is very little. Because uh, that collection of texts seems to have been located and uh, located at one at least one point in time and uh, you know cultivated by a very specific group within broader Jewish society, a group that uh, is really in no way reflective of what we might consider everyday Jews. Uh, you know, in the very least, the Qumran community was a self-selecting group that went out in, to live in this particular community. So it tells us something about the literacy levels of at least some of the people in that community. It tells us nothing, in my opinion, about literacy in general. Uh, so people bring this topic up uh, frequently in order to kind of make the point that, oh, there were manuscripts everywhere. Uh, you know, there was writing everywhere. To my knowledge, the people that argue that literacy levels were low don't deny the presence of those manuscripts. The question is not whether people were reading and writing text. It, the question is who was reading and writing text. And the, you know, even within the earliest communities of Jesus' followers and then into the second and third centuries and later Christianity, there were lots and lots and lots of manuscripts going around. But that did not mean that, the, that everyone was capable of reading them, much less capable of reading them, say, in public or reading them or wealthy enough to own them privately. Uh, so the material evidence itself does not enable or support a direct line of connection to a broad, a widespread, a broad scale level of literacy uh, in the Judaism of Jesus's day. How do we have a good idea? about the percentage of uh, Jesus, of what of how many people in Jesus's movement might have been literate or is that pretty much unknown well the question is to what extent Jesus's community would have been reflective of what we know about Judaism at the time uh, in general and or if you want to flip that th that approach on its head the question is, uh, do we have any reason to think that they're different from the Judaism of that time in general? And my suggestion or my opinion is that, no, we don't have any reason to suspect that they are starkly different than, uh, you know, the, the majority of the rest of the Jews at the time. Uh, Jesus' movement, by all accounts, was not Qumran. Uh, 
It was not a community like that. Um, so, you know, I, I don't know if that's answering your question, uh, but uh, when it comes to the percentages, we don't we don't really know. I mean, anybody who says, oh, no, it's 3%, not 5%, or 8%, not 10%, I, I don't know how they're figuring that out. The way that people that get to levels of literacy around 10% or so is in studies of agrarian societies, uh, studies of the impact of, of, you know, what we would consider publicly funded education systems, which were with minor exceptions in ancient Greece, pretty much absent in antiquity. Uh, we don't have anything like a public school system. Uh, previous generations of scholars liked to argue, and I <laughs> got an email a, a week or so ago from someone who's renewing an argument that synagogues taught reading and writis, writing. There is no evidence that synagogues taught reading and writing to elementary school kids or, or to children. Uh, did people read and write in synagogues? I am sure. But whether that was one person or two people or 99% of the people there is is totally up for grabs. Uh, or really, it's not up for grabs. But my point is that, um, I, like I said earlier, the material evidence itself doesn't enable a direct line of connection between exactly how many people were. Uh, there's one scholar who argued that Judaism in the Second Temple period would have had a literacy level lower, closer to 3%. William Harris famously argued for uh, 10%. Even if you suggest that Harris was, there were three times as many literate people in Jesus' time as Harris attributes to the ancient world in general, you're still left with a stark minority of literate people. So I think a lot of people are a lot more comfortable with saying that it was a majority illiterate uh, rather than saying a particular percentage. The most recent, to my knowledge, thorough study of this issue is Michael Wise's study of Roman Judea and specifically the Babathakash. And uh, he largely uh, agrees with uh, previous studies. Yeah, there were people who were reading and writing. Uh, in terms of the general population, it was a slim percentage of them. We've got a super chat question from the Muslim apologist. Thank you for your super chat. Would it have been highly possible for Jesus to preach the gospel in Aramaic instead of in Greek? Uh, yes, uh, beyond being possible, it was Probable. I mean, most scholars, including myself, think that uh, the Aramaic was Jesus' first language and that almost certainly he spoke Aramaic the majority of the time uh, to the extent that you would have to argue that Jesus said some things in Greek uh, and rather than just assume that he did. And people do uh, make that argument and convincingly. I don't think there's any reason to think that Jesus could not speak Greek when he wanted to. Uh, at least a little bit. But uh, yes, it's highly possible for Jesus to have preached in Aramaic and indeed likely, much more likely that he preached in Aramaic than he preached in Greek. That super chat gets me uh, to think of a, another question. Is it, do we have any good evidence of knowing what Jesus's language was precisely or his main language was because I know that there's an argument by some scholars like okay we don't know what language he actually spoke some say it's Greek Hebrew or Aramaic or some some fewer think he's bilingual or even trilingual what do you think well there are certain there are certain uh sayings of Jesus there's a famous one uh where in Greek it makes uh it makes less sense, but in Aramaic, uh, there is a play on words between Kalma and Gamla. And uh, the idea is that, you know, the the play on words really works in Aramaic, whereas it doesn't work in Greek. So probably it was given in Aramaic. Uh, there are other places where particular words or phrases or answers that Jesus gives uh, make the most sense in Greek. Uh, Stan Porter has done some work on that, of the work of Stan's that I find convincing. I think that this is some of his 
interesting work that there's particular places in the gospels that it makes most sense that Jesus would have spoken in Greek. Of course, the gospels are written, the, the copies of the gospels that we have are written in Greek. The question is what type of Aramaic might uh, lie underneath of them. The trouble that you get into methodologically there that becomes very difficult is you really don't know whether, for example, if Jesus, if there's a particular play on words that works in Aramaic, but it doesn't work on Greek, work in Greek, does that mean that Jesus originally spoke it in Aramaic? Or does it mean that uh, a gospel author, you know, knew that this would have worked in this way? You know, it, the, the, in other words, how we get directly back to Jesus, uh, as you and I have stopped, have spoken about Jacob on other occasions, is, a, in my opinion, a substantially more complicated issue than a lot of scholars give it credit for. Uh, and the language that he would have spoken would have been affected by that type of thing as well. Uh, so I have great comfort. I have lots of comfort in saying that Jesus would have spoken in Aramaic, uh, probably spoken Greek too. Uh, would he have known some words and phrases and had some capacity in Hebrew? Maybe. Uh, I think that all of this is spoken, though. Uh, as I said, I, I think that to whatever extent we can talk about Jesus being literate, he would have been a functional form of literacy. And we don't have any reason to think, in my opinion, that Jesus was what I would call scribally literate. Uh, in other words, that he probably could have uh, picked up a, a, a scroll of Isaiah the way Luke says he did and just read it publicly in Hebrew. I, I think that's very unlikely. These uh, supposed um, um, Aramaic words coming into, into the Greek that you were talking about, do you think that those uh, that, that material came into the Gospels via an Aramaic text that they read? Maybe something like... Uh, lost Hebrew gospel some of the church fathers talk about, or do you think this is just simply oral tradition? Or either, or both, or neither. I mean, it could have been the media environment of Jesus was uh, really complex. I don't personally think that if there was an underlying Aramaic or even Hebrew document that we're really capable of reconstructing that. So even if it's there, I don't, really trust the people who think that they can recreate it. Uh, whether it's just oral tradition, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's oral tradition at some point in time or another. Is it reoralized written tradition? Is it what I would call the memory of a text where someone knows that, knows textual tradition or knows that tradition is in a text, but they aren't stopping to look it up. They're just working from memory as happens in the patristic period quite a bit. We see people making citations like, oh, it says somewhere. They know that if there's a text back there, but they're not accessing a text. Could it be something like that? M maybe. Uh, so uh, unfortunately, I can't give you a direct yes or no, Jacob. It could have been, it, it could have been that. Uh, in the very least, it was oral. Uh, could it have been written? Maybe. Sorry, it's not very helpful. <laughs> Oh, no, no. I thought that was helpful. Um, but I want to come back to the literacy of Jesus. Um, you mentioned earlier that you think that he most likely could read, but most likely could not write. No, I don't think okay. he could have done either. Okay. Um, I misheard something then. What, what leads you to the conclusion that he didn't either? Oh, I'm sorry. You're... you're... I think we're both right. I said that if if we can speak of Jesus having any type of reading ability, like maybe he could have recognized, you know, uh, words on coins or something like that. You know, it, we have to re remember there's a big difference between having some type of functional literacy and being fluent and fully literate in a language. For example, you cannot go to a cemetery and conclude from every tombstone that has Latin on that tombstone that all of those people could read Latin any more than you could look at people with marine tattoos or stickers on their vehicles and say, oh, they have Semper Fi on there. That, they must know Latin. It, chances are that like people in sororities and fraternities, the extent of those ancient languages that they know are, you know, what's 
on their tattoo or on their tombstone. It's not like they could pick up Virgil uh, if they have a Semper Fi tattoo. So whether Jesus could have recognized some things, whether he could have written his name, recognized his name, whether he could have had some type of functional level of reading literacy, the Gospels are never, ever interested in that. They never portray that level of literacy. They never talk about that level of literacy. The only literacy they'd ever talk about is Jesus' ability to read Torah. Uh, and then in the story of the woman caught in adultery, his ability to write. So, uh, you know, that's, those are very, that, that's a very specific kind of literacy that is a high level of literacy in Jesus' day and age. Uh, the ability to read Torah, e even more so, as Luke says, to read Torah publicly, that's a specialist skill in Jesus' time. Not many people could do that. Even in Qumran, not everyone could do that. We know this from the Qumran documents. So, uh, you know, uh, it, he, if he could do some minor things, we have no way of knowing. But the literacy that they talk about, uh, in my opinion, uh, he, he, it's very unlikely that he would have had that, even though someone like Luke thinks, or at least wants you to think he could. Do you think um, Jesus is limited ability to read like he has he could read some stuff, but he really couldn't read a lot in general. Could this explain why the Gospels will sometimes say he could read and other texts seem to portray that he could not? I don't think so, again, because the God, those texts that talk about Jesus reading or texts where he challenges other people on the assumption that they could read when he says to the scribes and Pharisees, have you never read, right? Some people some people argue that that means Jesus could read, but that's I don't think that's what's happening there. I think that Jesus is shaming them with the assumption that they can read. In other words, well, you of all people should know this. You're the people who can read. At no point in time does Jesus say, I can. Um, Luke thinks Jesus could read. Luke claims that Jesus stands up in the synagogue and reads from a, a scroll of Isaiah. Uh that again, it's not it's not a rudimentary form of literacy. That is reading a Hebrew manuscript publicly. That's a specialized skill. Uh, that so whether Jesus could have read his name, whether he could have read a sign, could he have read the sign above him on the cross? No idea. I, I don't. I genuinely don't think that. Uh, we can be responsible historians and say that we know one way or another. There is absolutely no evidence of that. What we do know is that uh, if he did, it's not the same level of, li of literacy as fully compositional or fluent reading uh, literacy. But based on the data that we that we do have, what would you say is the most, what was the highest probability? really explains what's going on with Jesus. Did he have limited literary capability or not? Again, I don't think the sources, I don't think we have any data for whether Jesus had a limited level of literacy. The only literacy that the sources and the data show, the, the, the historical sources for Jesus of Nazareth tell us about is a specific type of literacy called scribal literacy. That, uh, that I, that's not a term that's original to me. I use it a lot, and it's not original to me. Uh, and there, I think the most likely explanation for why some people in the first century thought Jesus could read a scroll and why some people thought he could not is that oh, it's more likely that he could not but managed to convince some people that he could. Um, you know, that, that he was in the public arena with people that were known to do that type of thing. And that if he convinced people that he knew more than they did, or that he bested them publicly in an argument, that that would lead at least some people to think, well, Jesus, Jesus must be a teacher just like those teachers, even if other people thought, uh, no, he's not. So one of the core aspects of my theory about Jesus' literacy or illiteracy 
is that if you ask the his if if you could you know this is this common thing but if you could travel back in time and talk to people who were standing next to Jesus while he was teaching and ask them do you think he was literate the answer that you would have gotten would have depended on who you asked i think that uh you know one of my books i use the example i think that a a, a farmer in jerusalem for passover or a festival who had never seen jesus didn't know anything about him but saw him arguing in the temple with pharisees could have easily walked up on that argument any of the arguments like in mark 12 could have walked up on that argument and said well, he must be one of them. Yeah, he must He must be literate. He must be an authoritative teacher. Whereas if you walked up to the Pharisees themselves and said that, they said, no, he's stirring up a crowd. He's pretty good at what he has, but he's not one of us. He's, he's not a, a trained. I think they ask him, by whose authority do you say, do you say these things for a reason? The, and the implication is no one's. You don't have authority to be saying these things. They're trying to shame him. I like the shift to discussing um, rather of the Gospels were meant for public or private reading. Um, you mentioned uh, that Mark 13, 14 and Matthew 24, 15 uh, says, let the reader understand. Does this indicate to you that both of the uh, both of these two Gospels were meant for public reading? Uh, well, it depends on what you mean by public, but I think that they were meant for reading and assembly. But that being said, what do you make of Luke and John? Were they meant for private reading, public, or assembly? Well, I think that I, I think that it's. I would uh, argue very strenuously that Luke and John both know previous gospels. And if that's the case, to whatever degree they're trying to undermine them or create their own distinct contribution to the trend to the tradition transmission, uh, they are piggybacking on the success of their predecessors. And if they're doing that, and I'm pretty convinced they are, then they're trying to be what their predecessors were. And so I would suggest, yes, that even though they don't have explicit statements the way that uh, Mark 13 and Matthew 24 do, that they were intended by and large for the same kind of readership, which would have been in assembly. That doesn't mean they could not have had other readers in their purview as well. Uh, but I think that the primary audience would have been uh, a publicly or a, a, uh, an assembled group, uh, most likely in a worship context. I, I think that this reading practice is probably based on uh, synagogue practice and was carried on through the early church uh, in, in terms of social dynamics in very similar ways. Do you think that John chapter 21 is a later addition to the gospel? If it is, I don't think we ha can be confident in saying that. Now, I have to admit, though, I am in the minority, a growing minority, but I'm in the minority on that. Uh, the vast majority of Jehanine scholars will tell you that John 21 was a later edition. For me, I think uh, we have absolutely no manuscript evidence of a version of the Gospel of John ever circulating without John 21. Uh, the John, 30, John 21 being a later edition is a theory that has become gospel. Uh, and for me, I don't think that you have to posit the idea that it's later in order to explain a lot. We have parts of John that unquestionably were added later. And the manuscript evidence contributes to our confidence that they were indeed added later. The manuscript evidence offers no such confidence, no such evidence uh, for John 21's later edition. So for me, the fact that we don't have early readers of John talking about a John 20, uh, a, a Gospel of John without John 21, and the fact that we don't have any physical evidence of the Gospel of John ever circulating uh, without John 21 is more powerful than uh, the literary arguments that people find convincing. Again, though, I'm in the minority on this. Uh, most Jehanine scholars would have just said yes, 
material that is known to have been definitely added to the Gospel of John at a later point, is it a significant ma amount of material, or is it just minor additions to the text? Well, I mean, my significance is in the eye of the beholder. Uh, you know, if you're someone who believes that the Bible dropped down out of the sky, then any amount of later edition is a problem for you. Uh, I think that if you're someone who studies these texts um, and similar kinds of written tradition from antiquity, the idea that there are later additions to the text is not an aberration at all. It is quite simply normal business for ancient copying and circulation of manuscripts. It's just the way that it happens. If it didn't happen this way, it probably wouldn't have happened at all. So are there significant later editions? I mean, for in Jehanine tradition, the most significant later edition is the story of the woman caught in adultery, which I spent a lot of time studying. You also have uh, the uh, adding of the troubling, the troubling of the waters uh, in John 5. You know, if, if you believe John 21 was added later, that's a pretty significant later contribution. Uh, but, you know, we it, it depends on, you know, do, I, I would say there's nothing that radically alters the, the version of the story that's in there. In fact, I tend to think uh, rather strongly that the people who read, who added these traditions to the manuscripts were pretty careful readers of the manuscripts and made pretty logical, determined, uh, considered decisions that these stories fit in these places for a reason. I don't think that what they were doing was haphazard. You discuss the competitive textualization of the Johannine and Thomasine traditions. How are they in competition with one another? Well, I don't think John's in competition with Thomas at all. Uh, I think that Thomas is in competition with uh, with uh, John. When I refer to the the competitive textualization of the Johannine tradition, uh, I think that John is in competition, and purposefully so, with his predecessors in written gospel tradition. He doesn't name them. Uh, other than saying that there are other books, there's other other books about Jesus that you can consult, and and then claiming that his book is the one that gives life. But I think that I mean I'm convinced that at least one of those we know he he refers to multiple ones, uh, so it has to be at least two. I'm pretty well convinced that at least one of those was Mark, uh, based on the fact that. Uh, it makes a lot of sense that John is altering parts of Mark in agreeing and disagreeing in various places with what Mark did. And I think that John is making a claim. Uh, we see the same thing in Luke. You know, Luke starts off his gospel and says, uh, you know, as many others have endeavored to, uh, you know, to tell the Jesus story. And then he skips down the prologue and says, I too decided to write. But he goes out of his way to say that I did it in order. There's a specific Greek term there. Uh, he refers to a diegesis, a, a narrative. He also says that he did it on the basis of eyewitness, uh, uh, of talking to eyewitnesses of Jesus, uh, the people who uh, witnessed Jesus. So there's, in my mind, a trajectory. Uh, you know, Luke claims that he... Uh, interviewed eyewitnesses. John claims that he was an eyewitness. And then if you, so John's claim, yeah, that, that's great that you talked to people who were there. I was there. And this is my gospel. Uh, and then Thomas comes along at the very beginning of his gospel. He claims Jesus dictated this story straight to him. So we see this progression where Luke says, other people have tried I'm going to finally write it in order, and I did it by talking to people who were really there. John comes along and says, good, good try. I actually was there myself. My gospel leads to salvif salvific life. And Thomas comes along and says, oh, it's great that you guys were uh, dependent on eyewitnesses, even yourselves. Uh, I got this straight from Jesus. So there's a one-upsmanship going on, in my opinion. That's what I mean by competitive textualization. And it is specifically done as written text. Mm 
What are the problems with claiming that the Gospel of John is independent of the synoptics? Several scholars think that John is independent, has nothing to do with the synoptics. Some say he knew Mark but didn't know Matthew and Luke, or maybe he knew all of them. What's the deal there? Well, there are a number of ways to answer that, but I think that in short, it's because sometimes Johannine scholars are lazy. Uh, I think it's also because if you argue that John is independent, then all of a sudden you have another witness, another historical source that's independent, that's another stream of tradition, and people like to have that separate historical source. So now instead of having, you know, uh, if if Mar Matthew and Luke both knew Mark and Mark claims something, you, you can't say you really have one independent witness because Matthew and Luke are both copying off Mark. But if John's independent and it's got the same story, then we have at least two witnesses. We have at least two, two pieces of evidence, two sources. Uh, you know, if Thomas happens to say it too, and you think Thomas is independent, then, oh, we have three sources that claim this thing about Jesus. And I think that a lot of times in the history of scholarship, people press Johannine independence in order to safeguard their arguments for the historical Jesus. I also think that um, uh, in, uh, you know, for lack of a better way to say it, Bultmann thought, uh, or not Bultmann, uh, but, um, well, in English speaking, in English speaking scholarship is really Moody Smith and then before Moody Smith, it was Percival Gardner, uh, Gardner Smith. And I think they had really bad arguments. In the case of uh, Gardner's, it was because he really wanted to um, to argue that everything that looks similar could be explained by oral tradition, but he had a very vague, ill-defined, uh, uh, convenient often understanding of oral tradition that was uh, underdeveloped. And then Moody Smith came along and really in the modern period, uh, solidified the opinion opinion that john was independent and like i said a lot of times people it this it, this isn't the only issue but in scholarship it's easier to just go with the flow if it's not really going to affect your argument so people kept going i will say though i think the tide is really turning on this i i, I think that a lot of people now are looking uh at the previous arguments and thinking they don't really hold water very well and that it looks really, really suspiciously like John is interacting with at least Mark in a number of places. Could you briefly describe the similarities between Mark and John, some points where they agree, where it looks like John is borrowing from Mark's pericopes? Well, uh, in Mark and John, you don't have... Uh, you don't have anything about Bethlehem. You have Jesus starting out in Nazareth. You have him dying in Jerusalem. You have uh, the interactions with uh, other Jewish teachers. You know, you have uh, the general trajectory. G uh, John has Jesus going in and out of Jerusalem, in and out of Jerusalem. Uh, Mark only has Jesus going into Jerusalem once, but, uh, but they share this idea that Jesus starts out in Nazareth, and he meets his end in Jerusalem. So there's this kind of Jerusalem-centric uh, end to the narrative. Uh, and, uh, you know, in uh, there are a number of places, you know, where you have differences and similarities right mixed together. Uh, for example, Jesus says, uh, said, makes a statement about not being dishonored except in his hometown or not being a prophet, not being honored except in his hometown. Well, that happens in Mark 6. It happens elsewhere, but it happens in John. But John looks a little bit different. It's not exactly like Mark's the same. The wording's not the exact same. Also, the, the topographical uh, context of the narrative or uh, the geographical context of the narrative is not the same. Uh, you know, when Jesus is talking about his hometown in Mark, it's one thing, uh, it's Nazareth almost certainly. Uh, you, there's a, a way that you could argue that maybe he means Capernaum, but it's almost certainly Nazareth. Uh, when he says it in John 4, uh, the town that he has most recently come from is in Samaria. Uh, 
uh, and it's it's a very confusing statement. A better example happens in uh, in Gethsemane, when in G in Mark's gospel in the Garden of Gethsemane in Mark fifteen, I think. Uh, Jesus quite explicitly says that he does not want to drink this cup, that he 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 will, that he prays for the cup to pass. He does not want to go to the cross. He explicitly says this, uh, not my will, but your will, that he prays that this cup will pass. In John 12, John has Jesus entertaining the exact same thing and rejecting even the idea of saying exactly what Mark has him say. But what should I say? What would I say that I asked for this cup to pass? But no, I've come for this. You know, th so it's really, really suspicious that 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 Jesus is talking about the exact same thing and then seems to be rejecting exactly what he does in another gospel. In another case, and, and that's another place where it sure looks like sure looks like Jesus and John knows Mark's Jesus. Do you think that the Gospel of John, well, let me rephrase that question. Some some argue that the Gospel of John was written in multiple compositional stages. Um, based on that argument, do you think it's possible that one author probably wrote his text of several notes, if any, combined into one Gospel later? Or does it seem like the way the Gospel of John reads, they wrote the whole thing and he didn't write it in editorial stages? I don't have any doubt that there were some kind of editorial stages at some point in time. I don't think John just sat down one night and wrote the whole thing out. Maybe he did. I don't know. Don't have any personal experience with it myself. Uh, what I do think is that the idea that we can clearly delineate the strata of John's gospel to the extent that someone like Rudolf Bultmann or Raymond Brown did, is bunk. And I think that that particular approach to the Gospels made sense in a very specific historical context in scholarship where scholars were obsessed with finding pre-literary versions of the Gospels. They were obsessed with getting behind the Gospels. It is not a coincidence that by and large, the, the, the idea of that historical Jesus scholarship, as we have known it for the past 150 years, and gospel, theories of gospel origins, it, such as Q, or in the Jehanine version of Q, the sign source, came out of the exact same socio-historical context. It is a very specific brand of German uh, scholarship that was obsessed with getting behind the text and then was imported in English-speaking scholarship. Now, that is not to say that the theories are wrong or that they did not contribute anything. I personally consider Rudolf Bultmann the greatest scholar of the 20th century, and I don't think that there's a close second. But I think that his theory about the sign source and then it was as it was developed even further later uh, in American soil by... Uh, uh, Robert Fortna, I think it. I, I think. I think it is a, a, a beautiful castle in the sky. It. I, I don't think that there's uh, any really good reason to say that it had to be like that. I really don't trust the scholars who think they can pick through uh, six different levels of the Gospel of John or three different levels that this was in this particular stage and that was in the other stage and. For me, it's it's not convincing, but there are a lot of people who think it is. So what is the deal with the so-called Gospel of Peter and Serapion? Well, what do you mean, what's the deal with it? Yeah, some people say that the Gospel of Peter represents earlier material, but like John Dominic Crossan does. You have others that say, oh, the Gospel of Peter is worthless. It just knows the synoptics. Serapion appears to be criticizing the Gospel of Peter in the late 2nd century. Yeah. 
Uh, well, Crossan, Crossan actually though thinks that there was a, a there was an earlier gospel, the Gospel of Peter, right, the, cross gospel. Called the cross gospel that was, uh, if I remember correctly, in Crossan's scheme, the earliest uh, written source for Jesus. Um, so Eusebius includes this story uh, about uh, the gospel in his church history about uh, Bishop Serapion visiting the city of Rosas because. Uh, people there were reading a gospel of Peter, a gospel called Peter, the so-called, the, the, the gospel called Peter. And uh, at first he tells them that's fine, uh, when he, but he hadn't read it himself. When he finally reads it, he tells them uh, not to read it uh, because it's heretical. Uh, and uh, for ages and ages and ages, all we had was this story that happens in Eusebius's church history about the gospel of Peter. We didn't have a gospel of Peter. Then uh, the Achmin fragment was discovered and uh, scholars identified this as the long lost gospel of Peter, a, main, a, a surviving manuscript of the gospel of Peter. A scholar by the name of Paul Foster came along and argued, uh, Foster's MO is often to wait for people to argue something and then say, oh, no, that's 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 too extreme. There's a more cautious version. And he did it with this, too. Said, oh, no, that's not the Gospel of Peter. The Gospel of Peter uh, would have been, uh, we don't know what it is, but we don't know that the Achmim uh, fragment is actually the Gospel of Peter. Then, uh, but now more recently, scholars, I think Tobias Nicholas and some others have pretty much uh, settled that, no, we can say that this was the Gospel of Peter, uh, the so-called Gospel of Peter. This Gospel was never accepted on the same level as, say, Matthew, uh, certainly not Matthew. Uh, but what I find intriguing about it is that they were reading it publicly in assembly the way that they read other Gospels. And so at least at this point in time, in this geographical location, the idea that you can only read certain gospels in 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 assembly when you're joining together uh, was not uh, particularly well defined, or in the very least, what we see in this story is those lines starting to take shape, because Bishop Serapion says, uh, you know, uh, yeah, I did let you read it the way that you were reading the received writings, the the authoritative writings, the the gospels actually associated with Peter, uh, almost certainly means Mark's gospel. Um, at first, I let you read them the same way that you read those, but now I'm telling you not to. So what we actually see is the development of the idea in this story, the, or the developing idea of the uh, that you can only read certain gospels certain ways in church. If, if it is the case that Matthew and Luke borrow from Mark, and then Luke borrows from Matthew and Mark, and John knows all three, what does that really tell us? Tell us does that seem to indicate? What I'm trying, the way I'm putting it is this: um, since they were copying, all of them are ultimately copying Mark one way or the other, and there appears to be a relationship with each other. John knows Luke and Matthew. Luke and Matthew know Mark. Luke knows Matthew. Uh, in, in that case, does it suggest that most of what we're told about Jesus isn't historical? And, and does it seem to like it's a, a grim situation that it's really difficult, almost impossible to reconstruct the historical Jesus? No. Why would it? Well, that's what I was saying is, it's like, the reason I put it that way, some, some scholars will say, it's difficult to reconstruct the historical Jesus because the gospels details seem to conflict with one another. And I think I asked you about a, a similar question to that extent before, but this is kind of putting it in a different way. Jacob, for these scholars, what do you think for them would count as good evidence for the historical Jesus? Well, some seem to look at it in uh, whatever is to our orthodox whatever appears to be more Jewish about Jesus, they assume is the original and the material that uh, appears more Hellenistic would be an elaboration or mythologization that came in later in the game. Some put it that way. 
I think that's a really bad um, approach to the relationship between Torah and Judaism and myth and Hellenization. Uh, both. I think it's a really anachronistic uh, and poor understanding of what those categories really even mean. At the time of Jesus, there was no Judaism that was not Hellenized. It was all Hellenized. Some of the most Torah-obsessed of the Jews wrote in Greek. And the, uh, the ancient notion of myth is not a fairy tale that what we would consider it. Uh, that doesn't mean that we can't make historical decisions that we might not think that some things happened and that some things did. What I'm saying is this idea that what we have is history on the one side and myth on the other side, and we don't really have any history for Jesus because they were copying off each other. Uh, first of all, to go back to that, I think the idea that they were copying off each other is also a really poor understanding of what was going on. I don't think anyone who works intricately with the relationships of the Gospels would walk away from that and say they were copying each other. Uh, because for one hand, or, or on the one hand, writing a manuscript in the ancient world was laborious. It was not something that you did easily. You had to be trained to do it. It was in some cases costly. And in the very least, it was time consuming compared to, say, just telling the story by word of mouth. So, so the idea that you're going to commit something to writing itself is rather significant. Doesn't prove that it happened. That doesn't prove that it didn't happen, for that matter. My point is, no one was being kind of haphazard and just going with the flow and doing what everybody else did. It was a conscious decision to put tradition into writing. Um, and there were historical reasons behind it. We can know, know them sometimes, but sometimes we don't know those. But also, what's actually happening in the gospel tradition is not everybody copying off each other, but you're watching the development, the careful curation and development. Sorry, I, I don't mean careful in the sense that it's historical. What I mean is that it's intentional. They're changing it. They're developing it. They're agreeing with predecessors. They're disagreeing with predecessors. You know, I, for one, think that there are spots where Luke looks at Mark's gospel and says, no, that's not what happened. And in other places where they said, yeah, that is what happened. And I think the same thing for John. I think John looks at Mark sometimes and says, no, no, that's not it. Uh, this is what really happened. Uh, and in other places, John thinks, yeah, what Mark said was right. But I think that you're you're dealing with people who are, who are uh, actively developing, creatively developing uh, the tradition. They're not just copying. So... You know, you've you've asked me a version of this before, and I know I, I know that um, uh, I know that for some of your shows, the the your audience really likes this, but it, it wears on me a little bit because I think that it's a it's a it's a it's unfair and unrealistic reduction of what's actually happening. Whether the gospels are historical or not, they are not simply copies of each other. And uh, for the people who would look at the Gospels and say, well, we can't know anything historically, I think because they because they knew each other, they I think, yeah, but that's how nearly everything in the ancient world worked. You know, it, there's this if there's a myth, it's the myth of a completely independent source, you know, it, even in, in early Christianity, people say, oh, well, Paul's an independent source. How? He's part of the same movement. He thinks the same things. He disagrees with the other things, but they all kind of have a pretty similar idea of who Jesus is. So I think that the idea of independence and its historical value is really, really overblown and doesn't really fit in the ancient world and that we can make decisions about how some things were more likely to ha have happened. Some things are more likely to be to have been made up. But it's not just by saying, oh, well, that's that can't be historical because it's not independent. That's just somebody who doesn't know what they're dealing with, to be honest with you. Going back to the subject of additions to a text, 
is there manuscript evidence that there were additions to Mark, Matthew, and Luke, just like there is some for John? Absolutely. Pick up any pick up any critical edition of the Greek New Testament and go to the bottom of the page. And we we have uh, last count over six thousand copies of uh, of fragments or manuscripts of the New Testament. And not a one of them agrees 100% with any other one. So there were lots of additions. Uh, you know, some of the most famous ones, Mark's, Mark's gospel did definitely have an ending added later. I had multiple endings added later. Uh, and the manuscript tradition has multiple endings for Mark's gospel. Uh, you know, Luke's gospel famously has the story of Jesus bleeding as if blood uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane that probably wasn't there originally. Uh, all of the gospels have stories that were added and other places there were um corrections to the greek there were uh you know there were what's commonly called eye and ear errors that were in the middle of the in the process of the circulation there's a place in paul's letters where you know the manuscript tradition has uh kathesemai kakesemai and ka and then one more that's very similar i can't remember exactly as a um, uh, omega instead of an omicron but they all sound alike and you know you're left uh, scholars are left you know making careers out of or trying to make careers out of uh, arguing what was most likely earlier and why it was changed this way or the other but yeah all of the gospels have additions to them and with the different endings in Mark chapter 16, do we have a pretty good idea what the original ending looked like, or is, has there been so much tampering that's difficult to know? Well, it would depend on who you ask, but I think that most New Testament scholars, most gospel scholars are pretty confident that it ended originally at, um, with, you know, uh, with the statement that the women, the women went out and said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. And that seemed to uh, prompt later additions uh, that were a little dissatisfied for whatever reason with that. Uh, the longer ending of Mark quite clearly draws on other texts that by the point in time that it was put in uh, were, you know, authoritative Christian writings. Uh, so I think the, the longer ending of Mark is a bit of a mishmash, a canonical mishmash of tradition. Uh, so th and that's one way that it's different from the story of the woman caught in adultery. Uh, they're often put together as kind of the two big interpolations into manuscripts. But the story of the woman caught in adultery is kind of an intact story, an intact narrative of its own that um, is not necessarily drawing on other tradition. It's just kind of this whole unit that gets put into the gospel of john between uh john seven and eight uh the longer ending of mark is drawing on i mean this some of that stuff happens in acts people have argued that some of it's from hebrews i mean it's it, but it's very obviously drawing on other gospel traditions you have something that looks like matthew's great commission uh you know you so uh i think they're different in that way but um, the long ending of Mark, yeah, I think most people would say 16.8. Or the short, the, the original ending was 16.8. Has there been any other modifications like that in Mark's gospel? Can you say that again, Jacob? Hmm. Has there been any other modifications like that? Not just in, Not just in the ending of the gospel, but in other chapters, textual editions. Let me think off the top of my head. Um, I'm sure there are. I'm drawing a blank right now. Uh, and there are particular manuscripts that are that where further additions are more common than others. Uh, I'll, I'll try to think of one. We'll have to come back to it. But uh, I'm, I'm sure that there are. So in my closing question, when one, let, let's say somebody that's watching this stream now or maybe in the future is trying to explore and get a better understanding of the synaptic problem, what would your advice be to someone like that that's trying to grasp the Gospels in this way? 
Uh, let me, uh, Jacob, let me go back to the previous question just real quick. Um, I should clarify that there's nothing, to my knowledge, there's nothing exactly like the longer ending, that it, meaning that big of a block of material. There's not another edition like that in manuscripts of Mark's gospel, but there are, you know, different little changes all over the place. I mean, I, off the top of my head, all right, so in Mark chapter 6, Jesus is identified as the, the carpenter, and there are certain manuscripts of the Gospel of Mark where he's identified instead as the son of the carpenter, which is actually the way that he's identified in Matthew 13. So you have this kind of cross-pollination that happens a lot uh, from people who are just familiar with the tradition and copying it because they know it from another way or another source or another manuscript. Uh, to get to your question about the synoptic problem, are you asking me how best to get into it or how uh, how best to, uh, to, to conceptualize it? I think conceptualize it, yeah. Well, one of the things that I would want to stress about the gospel the synoptic problem is that uh, even though it's a cottage industry in gospel studies, I mean, there are people who make their whole careers doing nothing but work on the synoptic problem. And even, even though it is an incredibly complex thing, it is not a completely atypical thing in the sense that you have these traditions that are borrowing from each other and creatively adapting them into new works. Um, you know, the, the, te the Jewish text, Jubilees, essentially retells the story of Genesis uh, and the early, early parts of Torah. And it is its own separate text, but it's also creatively adapting a previous story. And this is simply the way that tradition happened. The synoptic problem in that regard is no different than any other source critical question that scholars might ask of any other ancient writing, which is to say, what's the relationship between these various sources? How do we best account for it? The synoptic problem has been heightened in its significance because Many previous generations of scholars viewed the synoptic problem as a shorthand way to do historical Jesus work. If we could just get back to the original, the original earliest gospel, we'll get to the earliest source. And if we can get to the earliest source, we can get to the clearest image of Jesus. Uh, so the synoptic problem took on significance because of scholarship's obsession with origins. But from a media perspective, it's just it's just tradition transmission. Well, thank you for joining me today, Professor Keith. Jacob, yeah, thanks for having me again. I really appreciate it. Hello, viewers. Thanks for watching this video from the History Valley YouTube channel. Please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. And if any of you wish to further support this channel, please consider checking out this channel's Patreon page and becoming a patron, and or donate through PayPal or through Super Chat during a live stream. Thank you.